Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is kind of for our support group with the crisis counseling program. Um, it's for uh, just individuals who have mental health and physical health challenges to kind of um, have some psychoeducation, but also like some ways to meet other people and uh, just an open space for support. Um, so we have some fun speakers that have agreed to come and speak. And uh, here I have Sharon from Healthcare Home at Tri-County. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what she has to say about holistic health. So I'll, I'll let you uh, take the floor. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And so give me just a second to get that up there. Okay. Um, I'm actually, uh, my name's Sharon Wright, and I'm a registered nurse. Been with Tri-County about 13 years and worked on the med services side and uh, been over the healthcare home, which is kind of an unfortunate name. I tell everyone that a lot of people think it's home health and um, we actually are nurses and we also have a primary care doctor in our department who does con consultation with us. We actually teach on wellness and learning more about chronic diseases. Um, we do testing for like, um, cholesterol and diabetes and such. Uh, and we actually do, then do education on um, the topics that we, we highlight. So um, uh, again, um, uh, before that I was an ER nurse. So I kind of have had some, a lot of health and wellness education in the past. So I was just going to talk about that today. And I was going to start with uh, just the little thing, be well to do well, health is wealth. We talk about that a lot, that um, health, I mean, and also um, the health triangle, which is the holistic approach to health, realizing that our mental uh, health and our physical health and our social health and wellness are also intermingled, that um, if one of them, we're having a problem with one of them, it can very well affect the other two. Uh, and so just knowing, and uh, my talk today will focus a little bit more on the physical health side, just from being a nurse. And I'm sure y'all have a lot of speakers talking more on the mental health and the social side of it, but I will bring those in at the end just to tie it up. Um, so physical health, it deals with the body's ability to function. Um, we know that there's the parts of exercise, nutrition, sleep, alcohol and drugs, weight management, stress are part of it, as well as some other uh, aspects of self-care that we do speak on uh, with people in the healthcare home. And just focusing on what leads to good health is, again, it's eating well, uh, keeping weight, not particularly weight loss, but keeping weight under control, being at a healthy weight, um, physical activity, Sleep is a big one, self-care, regular visits with your primary care provider and smoking cessation, which um, is kind of a, a interesting thing for the healthcare home in that we have two tobacco treatment specialists who have been trained through a Mayo program who actually do educate on smoking cessation uh, and are available. And I'll talk at the end about how, if you want to be connected to healthcare home, if you're not already, how we are a benefit for you um, through Tri-County. Um, we'll start with eating well, um, but proper balanced meals, knowing that diet can reduce your risk of heart attack, stroke, high blood pressure. Cholesterol is a big one. That's a big um, part of the profile of people who are in our program is they have uh, high cholesterol readings a lot of times, which wouldn't lead to um, some serious health problems, but there are steps in reducing that risk, and that's a big area that we educate on, osteoporosis, particularly in women and diabetes. And just knowing that nutritious meals are a good way for energy, we want that energy, but choosing the right thing. And I was gonna talk a little bit on the plate method and stoplight diet and label reading uh, as part of this. There are a lot of aspects. I mean, people have all kinds of questions right now by intermittent fasting and such that we have uh, that I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of any of that today, but just some concrete methods that you could actually look up online to research more. Uh, the first one is the My Plate, and it actually comes from choosemyplate.gov. Uh, we actually, on the right, uh, you can see these. Um, little plates. We actually have these in a plastic version that we give out in our department. 
And they're really great because not only do they lead you into choosing health, a healthy, balanced meal on a plate, it also helps with portion control, which is a big thing. And you can kind of see on the left how a healthy plate is, although I would say probably not have eggs, bacon, and sausage in one section. It's just giving you ideas of what could go there because what we know is on our protein section, you typically want the palm side of your hand size of a meat or a deck of cards size of meat in that section. You can see vegetables. That's where you want most of the size, um, the plate to be filled as well as fruits. And then when it gets to grains, you know, picking those good, healthy, whole grains um, like oatmeal and uh, brown rice and brown breads and quinoa and such. Um, and then the protein being lean protein, lean meats and salmon and fish and such. Um, that's what really makes up a healthier plate. And this is also called the nine inch plate. It's interesting because as you know, in America and the United States, particularly, and you know, the plates have gotten bigger and bigger, like platters now, especially if you go to a restaurant. Nine inch plate is actually what we had like in the 50s and 60s and 70s before plates started growing. And so um, just if you have a nine inch plate at home, which is more like a salad plate, you can use it as a jumping off plate and then use print this diagram out from the internet and kind of use it as a guide to fill your plate according to that. Uh, some people who are diabetic then also know about the eight inch plate if they've met with a nutritionist or such before knowing that you may need um, even a little smaller quantity, but good quality food. The second one is traffic light diet, stoplight diet. I think it's really interesting and it's easily looked up online too because KU actually did a study on it. And if you go in and just type KU traffic light or KU traffic light or KU stoplight diet, you pull up this great colorful pictorial and it's all broken down into green light, yellow light, red light. Whereas you can see maybe online, you can see it really well online because it breaks it down bigger. Green light are those foods that you have, every, you should be having every meal, uh, like the healthy fats, the veggies, the fruits um, and such that you can have freely. The yellow light uh, is those that you should have like a couple of times a week. It actually has hot dogs, hamburgers on it. And this is too depends on if you have high blood pressure or diabetes and such. But it's those that are you need to be cautious with, but you can still have. The red lights, we tell people that's like your treat food that you have to ever once in a while. It's the ice cream, the candies, the potato chips. But it's just, it's a really good uh, tool. It's also pictorial. So um, we've used it for people who maybe um, didn't speak English or maybe, you know, reading um, was more of a challenge. It's, it's just, it's a really interesting site to go look at. Label reading is another area that we really focus on. And this is a really simplistic um, label reading breakdown because it says get enough of these nutrients. It does have sugar in that part. And it it's the focus is like not watching your sugar intake, but knowing we do need carbs. We need fiber that helps with weight control and with our heart health and and our digestive health and such, but also protein, um, knowing that we need that protein for our brains to work right and all, and that getting those good proteins that we talked about. But watching, limiting those nutrients, um, like the heavy saturated fats and such. But this um, label reading is a good tool. If anybody is interested in that, we do have some really good handouts we give people and some education along that. And one of the things that I found interesting when I really started paying attention to the labels in this job is that when you turn those labels over, because you may think it's one serving, it's a bag of chips, it's a bag of some, something, it's one serving is the bag, it's you ought to look at it how many times it's two two and a half servings and that you're you know we're not really cognizant of that we're just thinking we're eating a serving of something and then when you do that these numbers are really much greater than what it shows on the bag because it's telling you how much that is per serving um so just being really aware of that but we do have those handouts if if anyone is interested and in, when um at some point uh, and just, you know, a lot of this all figures into metabolic syndrome. That's kind of how the healthcare home started. It was discovered that people um, 
Amer you know, people in the United States and across the world have metabolic syndrome, but people with mental health um, issues sometimes have a greater degree of it and just need to really watch their blood sugar, their blood pressures, their weight, their uh, their BMI or their, their percentage of fat that they have on their body and their cholesterol a bit greater. Because if you have like three of these, uh, then you have metabolic syndrome. Uh, and this guy, he's got it bad. Um, because when we think about those things about diabetes and high blood pressure and all those I just spoke of, but it can affect other things. I mean, people who have gout has an effect on your liver, your eyes, um, just all parts of your body. So just staying healthier keeps us from not just having those big events like stroke and heart attacks. It can, it can help prevent other things or aggravate things that maybe we haven't even realized that may be related to our diet. Um, just briefly, this is an area we could maybe go into at a later date is uh, diabetes, um, knowing like um, pre versus um, pre-diabetes. A lot of us have heard insulin resistance and this, this little um, slide on the left, show, it shows like, I mean, if you're diabetic, you know about hemoglobin A1C. Um, what I always tell people is like, what happens when you're pre-diabetic is here's your cell here and here's your pan pancreas up here and it's shooting out insulin, which usually it goes in that cell and takes care of the glucose. But as we, you know, have hereditary issues, you know, that make us lean towards having diabetes or we um, are, you know, our diet is kind of promoting it, our, our maybe look, kind of less energetic health um, lifestyle and such, it gets to where our cells get really resistant and the pancreas keeps shooting that insulin out, but it's not going into the cells. And so you can see um, for a high hemoglobin A1C, you can see how those little uh, blue things are gathering on the outside of the cell more so. It's not getting into the cell like it is. So we get resistant, insulin resistant, or pre-diabetic. So that's just something to really watch. Um, and just, you know, I won't go into A1C. That's a whole different topic we could really center on if anyone's interested in hearing more about it. But um, it is part of being um, a, you know, having issues. I, I may mean, I mean, cut some of my slides. Apparently I didn't cut some of them. Um, so anyway, just insulin resistance again, it just shows uh, some of the the ways how you eat that healthy diet, how your your body's trying to fight that glucose in your blood and how it just keeps gathering on the cells. Uh, and then blood pressure is a next issue. I mean, I'm, same thing, we can focus on it more so if you want to, but just knowing what your blood pressure is, um, the textbook old uh, 120 over 80, now they're thinking that's probably a little bit high especially if you start at that earlier in life and that we really should be trying to focus on maybe being a little uh, lower than that to start. And um, our focus this month in healthcare home actually is heart, heart health because that is the national focus. February is heart health month. And so we'll be at educating out in the community and all on like the hard warnings of heart attacks and such. Uh, which you have here, which is interesting because they can differ in women than in men. Men have that textbook crushing feeling in their chest going down their left arm. Women can have stomach pain. They can have back pain. They can be nauseous. They can be sh only short of breath. And just knowing that women um, just need to be more aware that they don't have those textbook symptoms all the time when they're having heart problems and being aware that if you're having jaw, just your jaws hurting or you're hurting like and you think it's your gallbladder, getting it checked out because it may be your gallbladder, it could be your heart and just being really aware, especially when you have a strong family history. And then just stroke. I mean, watching for those chase. This is a little um, chart of like now it's considered faster as the the term that you look for, looking at the face droop, uh, looking at arm weakness, um, stability when people are walking, stability when they're, you know, they're talking is clear or not. Their eyes, pupils equal, or one eye is um, not closing along with the other and, and just reaction time is slowed and such. It's uh, knowing these about yourself as well as like being aware of them when you live with someone else that may be at risk for stroke and such. 
Uh, cholesterol, another area we can go a lot into um, more so, but this just shows you, you the clean vessel over here and how as time goes on, plaque builds up in our, our arteries uh, that go to our vessels. I mean, not just heart and head, but to, um, to kidneys and, and um, just all of our organs. And it really can cause issues as that begins to um, block up. And that's something we actually test for. We have the machines to test for uh, high cholesterol in the healthcare home. Um, and you hear about that bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. Um, the good cholesterol is like the HDL cholesterol, if your doctor ever says that. And I, it's got a long, more scientific name. I call it the happy, happy cholesterol because it actually goes through and kind of does a roto rooter of your vessels and helps clean out your vessels. And what helps it is not smoking, eating green leafy vegetables, um, just exercise and just, you know, just healthier eating overall. The LDL also has a more chemical sounding name. I call it the low down cholesterol because it's the one that goes to and clogs up your vessels with plaque. And so that's, we actually check those in the healthcare home for those, um, you, your doctor, on if he ever does your cholesterol level, he checks those too. It's also called a lipid profile. So that gets checked because it is so important that cholesterol is a precursor of stroke and high blood pressure and such. Um, and I'll just skip past that. The next one um, is weight loss or healthy weight, actually. Um, and what's interesting about this is that I, it was kind of a light bulb moment for me. I was sitting in a, a meeting uh, for healthcare home directors and one of the doctors said, if you lose 8% of your body weight, you can come off of a medicine, reduce your insulin. Into, if you have to take insulin for diabetes, you can reduce maybe a blood pressure medicine or a cholesterol medicine. I thought that was really interesting because when people come to us when we're working with them in the healthcare home, they want to set a, one of those treatment plan goals that you know we as healthcare providers work with you on. And people want to say, I need to lose 50 pounds. I need to lose 100 pounds. And setting that as a goal it kind of sets you up for failure. I mean, that's just a big number that's really hard to reach and can really kind of get you down if you think about it that way. But if you think I'm 250 pounds and it's eight, it's five to 10%, 8% is the real textbook measure. I use 10% because you can knock that last number off of your weight and know how many pounds that would make a difference. So 250 pounds, you know, 25 pounds weight loss could do those positive aspects of lengthening your, your life or maybe cutting down on some medications that you take. That's, to me, that was a big light bulb moment that that amount of weight can make that drastic a difference. So um, I think that's a good takeaway, um, if anything. The next one is physical health and exercise. And that's another thing we notice when people come see us in the healthcare home. A lot of times people think that means you need to join a gym. And that's expensive. I know for me, it's expensive. I don't, you know, I'm not a member of a gym. Uh, actually, the one in, in the Maple Woods, one in the um, the building is actually, I mean, when, you know, when the everything is opened up is a good alternative. But you don't have to have a gym membership to exercise. You don't have to run or exercise 60 straight minutes to, for it to be exercise. You can do five to 10 minutes burst of some activity several times a day, get your heart rate up, or as I've seen it, I heard a doctor say, break a sweat. That's exercise. And for some of us, it doesn't take long to break a sweat. So, um, so just you know, walking when weather permits is can be health, heart healthy. But what we've said a lot in the healthcare home and people are kind of surprised is turn your radio on or your music on and dance. It is a tremendous form of exercise. And we've had people who think that it's reserved for weddings and special events, but just doing that is amazing. I had a client work, walk into my office one time and she's, I didn't know who she was. She walked up to me and she says, you don't know who I am. I said, I, I, I can't, your face is familiar kind of thing. And she said her name and she said, you told me to dance and I have danced. And she had lost a, um, almost a hundred pounds just by taking our, I'm sure our nutrition advice too, but she said she started dancing every day 
and had never exercised before. So dancing is a great thing. What we also tell people is like, if you're unsteady on your feet, I mean, you don't want to get too far away from the couch. Uh, you, one thing we tell people is get up and walk during the commercials. If you're a TV watcher, which everybody's a Netflix watcher pretty much at the moment, but if you're doing two or three hours straight watching TV, regular TV, hit the commercials, get up, walk in place, get those arms moving, do a march as much as you can. You're still close by the couch if you need to lower yourself back down. Um, but just those bursts of energy, that's better than not exercising at all and it can get your heart rate up. There are also free apps up out, apps out there like my fitness pal. Um, that's a big one a lot of the community support workers use and, and talk to their clients about. Um, not only does it have like healthy diets and um, rec a recording device in it to where you can record your calories, it also has physical physical activity examples and such. Pinterest has a lot of information. When I started Googling, which I'm got about to pull up some things, Pinterest has a lot of stuff. And I think some of them are funny because I think laughter, laughter helps burn calories too and gets your heart rate up and gets more oxygen into your lungs when you laugh. And some of these were just really pretty funny where like this one says to raise your arm, raise the roof, but just make sure that you've shaved your armpits before you do it. Or this guy in the second one, uh, he's swinging his arms back and kicking, um, that you actually could kick someone behind you. Or the last one's the hallelujah, which is funny that they said people maybe would look fun, look at you funny if you did it in public, but it's actually swinging around. And you say something like hallelujah or something when you're doing it. These are really simplistic and that's kind of just silly, but there's simple exercises that you can do um, that costs nothing. And if you do 10 reps of one after another, you have done exercise. If you're really energetic and do it a couple of times a day, you're really moving towards better health and better physical fitness. And for these old school people that were in PE back in the day, like myself, this is the stuff we used to do. If you're healthy enough to do jumping jacks, uh, I wouldn't be doing a push up, but I mean, to do crunches and such. These are just old fashioned exercises that still help with getting the heart rate up. Big thing is being more flexible. We probably lost a lot of flexibility during um, the quarantine and such. We're not moving as much. Flexibility is a big thing in us being stable on our feet and such and not being a fall risk and just feeling better. And these are simple things that we can do at home and count it our, we, our check off that we did some physical activity. Now this is kind of, I related to this. It says sometimes it's good to change your walking routine, try walking around the block instead of wandering around the kitchen. I think we, I probably for myself, I've wandered the kitchen a few times um, working at home, mostly from the moment. The next thing is physical health or sleep. Sleep's a big thing. And if you see one of the the uh, psychiatrists or nurse practitioners on the med services side, they really talk big on sleep hygiene. That's cleaning up your sleep habits. Um, and a lot of them, you know, sleeping at eight, eight hours a night, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, even on weekends, keeps your body clock from constantly trying to reset. Um, but just a big one is uh, we are so prone to looking at smart TVs and phones in the evening and so much many of them have blue lights that actually our bodies make natural melatonin and it actually uh, interrupts that natural melatonin production and can delay us going to sleep by two to three hours. So you really should um, stop your, your uh, smart device use two to three hours before you go to bed so your brain can do its thing and, and set its own melatonin levels and such. And if you nap, I mean, napping a lot can keep you sleeping, um, not sleeping well at night, but if you're not getting your six, eight hours in at night, then a nap during the day, same time, is not a bad thing to get your sleep that you need for your brain to work health uh, right. And also for weight um, for weight control it's a big thing they that science has proven that you know good sleep helps us to uh, control our weight better self-care is another big area and you, this is probably something we could all set our goals as to which part is greater for us this person actually chose it's thought sleep was 
really what was needed, but doing what you love. This is a time, you know, you're seeing all kinds of pe people doing arts and crafts and all on um, social media right now. People have found their new skills, knitting and such. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, meditation, prayers and such that keep us focused and centered, the healthy eating, reflecting on thoughts and emotions, taking time to measure why we reacted to something a certain way um, and just, you know, maybe journaling those things while you may be journaling what you're eating as well, um, because that's a good way to really keep account of um, the calories we're taking in. Fresh air is a big thing for self-care. I mean, just right now, walking out on the porch or whatever and just taking some deep, good breaths in. Um, moving your body, of course, like we talked about. In self-care, there's a lot of free things on Pinterest and, and Pinterest and being and all that kind of stuff out there too. It sounds very simplistic, but this is also big on stress reduction as well as self-care. Um, it's like decluttering is something a lot of people, which I've done while uh, while we're out, helps to clear up your brain space as well as your drawer space. Um, you know that fresh air thing and the health things I talked about. Um, you know, just drinking more water is a big focus of our the nurses in our healthcare home department. Um, mild dehydration runs rampant in us on a routine basis because we don't hydrate like we're supposed to. It's a big self-care practice, but there's all kinds of things out there. Uh, we have some really cool handouts we give out in the department too on that kind of tie into this and as well. Follow up with your medical provider. Um, it sounds you know, I think it kind of fell off the wagon during this period. And now, you know, you may have to go and sit in the parking lot and call in to your doctor and then they call you or come see you in the parking lot. But it's really important to still stay on top of it. You want to establish your health risk, rather it's her, your hereditary risk of illness, your health status right now, uh, your diagnoses, uh, keeping your body in check and knowing your blood pressure, your BMI, that percentage of your body fat, knowing your lipid levels, your cholesterol levels and such, keeping your mind in check. I mean, because as um, you know, people who, who do see the psychiatrists and the nurse practitioners know that you typically you go in for those checks every, usually every quarter. Uh, and that's, that's good because they're trained to pick up on those signs of maybe depression seek, uh, kind of seeping back in or like going in and really talking to them or doing your visit by Zoom if that's what you're doing at this time. Keeping those appointments going um, so depression can be caught early and kept in check. Get peace of mind. I like WebMD too, but WebMD it's kind of a slippery slope because you can, in the middle of the night, you can diagnose yourself with cancer and all kinds of things. So it's like, make sure you, that you're getting that um, second, that, well, that goes in a little cartoon, I got a minute, but getting that real opinion and not just diagnosing yourself on WebMD, it's a good thing to be educated about it, but you need that peace of mind of knowing what's really going on with yourself. Um, prevention, prevention, prevention is a big thing, keeping us from having, you know, the high cholesterol with those blockages down the road that could cause problems. And just, it's important for establishing that good relationship with your doctors. Because I can tell you, after working with them, when, you, when you're going in quarterly, you, you gain that relationship. They remember you when you walk in who you are and you can start off, they, I mean, they're much more in tune with, um, what your worries and concerns or your your status is at the time so keeping those appointments and, and staying stable so this guy that's what i kind of jumped ahead i already diagnosed myself on the internet i'm only here for the second opinion and this other one is, i'd be a lot healthier if you'd stop finding things wrong with me and that's the I have to say that's kind of funny, but we hear that a lot as people don't want to go to the doctor because they don't want to know what's wrong with them. And it's, I mean, you can, you could go and find out and get treatment and get a, ahead of it and not suffer the consequences down the road. So yes, it's funny in this cartoon, but it's really important. Like I said earlier on nicotine tobacco use, we do have two, um, tobacco treatment specialists who are available. You don't have to be in the healthcare home to use their services. Uh, you can call us at just the main uh, number, uh, the 816-468-0400, ask for healthcare home. Um, 
Abby uh, is a wellness coach and also um, the tobacco treatment specialist, as well as uh, Joanne, who's a nurse care manager and a tobacco treatment specialist. Or you can call and talk to me, Sharon. Uh, we check our messages and uh, we will um, call you back if you're interested in getting into just the tobacco treatment specialist program. Uh, something else I was going to mention back a slide about the primary care doctor. We're also the ones who are the liaisons to the Swope Health Clinics. Um, of course, the one in the agency is not open at the moment. Uh, most people are going to Swope Riverside, but we can help connect you and get you an appointment. So uh, as that as well, if you need um, help connecting to primary care. And it doesn't just have to be them. The nurses, uh, if you're a healthcare home um, client, we actually will help you connect to whoever you're interested in. So that's something to keep in mind, but just dangers of smoking. I mean, just they run the range, the range of COPD to problems with um, gas. It can cause gastric problems, eye diseases. You can see their, you know, osteoporosis, weak bones again in, in women. It's just a lot. And they're especially working, you know, not to your benefit when you combine it with alcohol, coffee, you know, a lot of caffeine, menthol cigarettes are more dangerous. Smoking, and this is a big one. We, you know, we see people doing this, you know, up at Tri-County is smoking out in the cold and smoking fast, trying to get back into the warm. What happens is your vessels are constricted because you're out in the cold and your vessels constrict because you're smoking. And that just really causes some blockages such to your heart and brain and such. So, I mean, it sets you up for more issues. So just something to consider. This one's just a little, just showing you like what, you know, the lung complications. And I won't go into this in great detail, except telling you, we do educate on uh, juuling vaping too. It's very important to know that a lot of the the e-cigarettes come from all over the world that don't have, I mean, not even in, in the United States, I mean, they're not FDA controlled really, but we have a lot more controls than a lot of places, but people are getting e-cigarettes that you don't know how much nicotine it can have a small amount, probably smaller than you want, or they can have huge amounts that are hitting your body. But not only that, they have formaldehyde and they have acids and alkalines and all sorts of chemicals in some of them that really are bad for your lungs um, just immediately. So just knowing it is controversial. There are people in smoking cessation who think um, that it's a, a good step down device and it can be, but it also can be like you're still smoking the same amount and juuling or vaping in between. So um, that's something that's just something to be aware of that they're not consistently controlled and can have some other effects besides just the usual smoking effects. So um, if y'all want to hear more about that, Abby is likes to talk about uh, vaping and e-cigarettes. And this is just a little thing that if you smoke, you've probably have seen it before. It's just really eye-opening that um, I won't go over it all, but 20 minutes, your blood pressure drops back to normal. Uh, one year, your risk of heart disease is reduced by 50%. And like after 20 years, your risk of heart, heart disease uh, after you quit smoking is that of a non-smoker. So you can't say it's too late. I mean, there's things that that are will start immediately if you decrease or re, um quit smoking. Alcohol and drugs, I mean, there's just a lot to that. I mean, they do, and that's a whole another talk, and there are people like um, Jan Poole and, and such that are really experts on this, but just knowing that they are, um, they do cause a lot of liver damage uh, as well as injuries and such. So, I mean, it does have a really um, impact on health that can really be gone into a lot more deeply. And just getting back to the health triangle, I mean, just knowing that your mental health, on how we cope with daily life, again, I mean, it puts so much impact on your health, uh, just the stress of it. Learning about it increases not only your knowledge base, but your self-confidence, your self-awareness, um, learning how to cope. Um, because, I mean, what I can tell you, I mean, I won't talk a lot about the different mental health issues, but stress management is one of the areas we do talk about in the healthcare home because it's important to learn how to, to really manage it more because of the impact on it. 
Um, we know that it, you know, chronic stress is a significant, you know, has significant effects on cancer and heart attacks and such. We know that we sometimes we think we're just stressed for the moment, but prolonged stress can build up in our systems and really affect our nervous system. Uh, that's a lot of times while we're jumpier at the spur of the moment. Um, and, you know, stress, sometimes we think we just got this big worsening of our fibromyalgia and our aches and pains and migraines and such and stress, that tensing up of our body so aggravates those kind of symptoms. And we have a lot of people with those diagnoses that stress management is a big, learning more about stress management is a big um, push towards dealing with those aches and pains that can be really life altering and affecting as well as, I mean, it can have effect on the digestive system. And of course, you know, weight gain associated with stress. And that's kind of the same slide there. So um, we'll go forward. Um, social health is the last as aspect. And probably this is one y'all are going to talk about more with other speakers on this. But just to tie it into the health triangle, uh, it deals with the pay way you not only that you deal with people in your environment, you know, those peers, your friends, your family. Um, they're your support system through your health process and your mental health and physical health process. And just, you know, knowing um, that when you need them, you need them to be there and they should, you know, when you feel comfortable to know what your health issues are, like when you go into the hospital and such, if that, if you're comfortable with that. And right now, I mean, immunizations are a big thing. We usually talk about it in terms of getting your your uh, your vaccinations, just routine vaccinations updated. Um, but right now, I mean, um, and it, it's, it's up to you whether you want to do the COVID vaccine, but it is becoming more prevalent. I noticed um, in the news today, Clay County is opening a, a, a vaccination clinic. So you can go to the Clay County Health Department site. There's actually an interest form on there that you can fill out and get your name on the list for when those immunizations uh, come available. So keep that in mind. And if, I mean, it, it's a, I think it's a good opportunity to help reduce the prevalence of COVID, um, but that is an option for you to go ahead and if you wish to go ahead and start that. And I think for Platt County, you can go to, I think for the Clay County, you can don't actually have to live in Clay County to go and sign up for it, but also uh, Platt County was gonna be through the Kansas City Health Department too, but go to the, the Clay County has information. So go there if you would like to get more information on it. Um, and then dental checkups, I won't talk on it a lot. And I know dental, getting a dentist is challenging um, for people, you know, with Medicaid and without insurance. Um, most of, I can tell you, most of what we advise people, the option is the sliding scale options or Medicaid through Swope Health and Samuel Rogers and Truman and such. There aren't a lot of options out there, but keeping your mouth as healthy as you can through bra um, flossing and brushing. And we actually once a year focus on that and give out toothbrushes and dental floss and all that kind of stuff. But that has a huge impact on overall physical health as well. And that's just kind of a public health announcement. Um, and family relations are kind of still tied into that. Um, and just that's what the healthcare home and just what Tri-County is all about. Their focus has been treating the whole person. It used to be just the focus was on the mental health and it Thank goodness that um, it's beginning to be realized that um, the importance of engaging the mental, social, and physical health for each person to where they can be as healthy as they can and live as long as they can. So that's kind of the why the healthcare home is out there and why if you have caseworkers and therapists and such that their focus is moved to um, whole person questions about uh, your physical health and all. That's why the, you know, everybody's on the same page and like promoting holistic whole person health. And this is just kind of my ending. One reason people resist change is because they focus on what they have to give up instead of what they have to gain. And that's kind of a light bulb moment for me as well. It seems like you're giving up all the good stuff, but when we focus on what we can gain through better health, it kind of makes more sense while we're doing it. And um, that's, this is really truly healthcare. And there's not one giant step 
to great health, it's a lot of little steps. So what I've gone through really quickly today, uh, if you choose to do healthcare home, you choose to call us, which you can, if you have questions, we will take questions in the healthcare home if you have them. Uh, it's a lot of little steps of taking like, it's, you know, really like each one of these slides and breaking it down in appointments with you and really teaching you steps to reaching this I, that I kind of moved through quickly today. So again, uh, 816-468-0400, you can ask for healthcare home and that'll reach one of us and we will answer your questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was, that was really informative and uh, I really appreciated that. That was great. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you.